placebo, Wikipedia article audio. A placebo from place, I please is a substance or treatment with no active therapeutic effect. A placebo may be given to a person in order to deceive the recipient into thinking that it is an active treatment. In drug testing and medical research, a placebo can be made to resemble an active medication or therapy so that it functions as a control, this is to prevent the recipient and slash or others from knowing whether a treatment is active or inactive, as expectations about efficacy can influence results. This psychological phenomenon, in which the recipient perceives an improvement in condition due to personal expectations, rather than the treatment itself, is known as the placebo effect or placebo response. Research about the effect is ongoing. Types Placebos are an important methodological tool in medical research. Common placebos include inert tablets, vehicle infusions, sham surgery, and other procedures based on false information. There is also some evidence that patients who know they are receiving a placebo still report subjective improvement in their condition if they are told that the placebo can make them feel better. It has further been observed that use of therapies about which patients are unaware may generally be less effective than using ones that patients are informed about, regardless of whether or not a placebo is involved. Placebo effects are the subject of scientific research aiming to understand underlying neurobiological mechanisms of action in pain relief, immunosuppression, Parkinson's disease, and depression. Brain imaging techniques done by Emerin Mayer, Johanna Jarko, and Matt Lieberman showed that placebo can have real, measurable effects on physiological changes in the brain. Placebos can produce some objective physiological changes, such as changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and chemical activity in the brain, in cases involving pain, depression, anxiety, fatigue, and some symptoms of Parkinson's. In other cases, like asthma, the effect is purely subjective, when the patient reports improvement despite no objective change in the underlying condition. Effects The placebo effect is a pervasive phenomenon, in fact, it is part of the response to any active medical intervention. The placebo effect points to the importance of perception and the brain's role in physical health. The use of placebos as treatment in clinical medicine is ethically problematic as it introduces deception and dishonesty into the doctor-patient relationship. The United Kingdom Parliamentary Committee on Science and Technology has stated that, prescribing placebos, usually relies on some degree of patient deception and prescribing pure placebos is bad medicine. Their effect is unreliable and unpredictable and cannot form the sole basis of any treatment on the NHS. Ethics In 1955, Henry K. Beecher proposed that placebos could have clinically important effects. This view was notably challenged when, in 2001, a systematic review of clinical trials concluded that there was no evidence of clinically important effects, except perhaps in the treatment of pain and continuous subjective outcomes. The article received a flurry of criticism but the authors later published a Cochrane review with similar conclusions. Most studies have attributed the difference from baseline until the end of the trial to a placebo effect, but the reviewers examined studies which had both placebo and untreated groups in order to distinguish the placebo effect from the natural progression of the disease. How the placebo effect works In a 1983 article, Clement J. MacDonald and others defined a placebo as a substance or procedure, that is objectively without specific activity for the condition being treated. Under this definition, a wide variety of things can be placebos and exhibit a placebo effect. 
However, the placebo effect may be a component of legitimate pharmacological therapies, pain-killing and anxiety-reducing drugs that are infused secretly without an individual's knowledge are less effective than when a patient knows they are receiving them. Likewise, the effects of stimulation from implanted electrodes in the brains of those with advanced Parkinson's disease are greater when they are aware they are receiving this stimulation. Sometimes administering or prescribing a placebo merges into fake medicine. Common placebos include pills or saline injections. Fake surgeries have also seen some use. An example is the Finnish Meniscal Legion Study Group's trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which found a sham meniscal surgery to be equally effective to the actual procedure. While examples of placebo treatments can be found, defining the placebo concept remains elusive. What a placebo really is The placebo effect has sometimes been defined as a physiological effect caused by the placebo, but Moerman and Jonas have pointed out that this seems illogical, as a placebo is an inert substance that does not directly cause anything. Instead they introduced the term meaning response for the meaning that the brain associates with the placebo, which causes a physiological placebo effect. They propose that the placebo, which may be unethical, could be avoided entirely if doctors comfort and encourage their patients' health. Ernst and Resch also attempted to distinguish between the true and perceived placebo effect as they argued that some of the effects attributed to the placebo effect could be due to other factors. Placebo Effect and the Brain Research suggests that for psychological reasons, some placebos are more effective than others. Large pills seem to work better than small pills, colored pills work better than white pills, an injection is more powerful than a pill and surgery gives a stronger placebo effect than injections do. Research has also shown when it comes to specific psychological disorders, such as mild or moderate depression, placebos have the same effects compared to antidepressants. Brain and Body Evolved Health Regulation Negative Effects Doctor-Patient Relationship the placebo effect has been controversial throughout history. Notable medical organizations have endorsed it, but in 1903 Richard Cabot concluded that it should be avoided because it is deceptive. Newman points out the placebo paradox it may be unethical to use a placebo, but also unethical not to use something that heals. He suggests to solve this dilemma by appropriating the meaning response in medicine, that is make use of the placebo effect, as long as the one administering, is honest, open, and believes in its potential healing power. Because the placebo response is simply the patient response that cannot be attributed to an investigational intervention, there are multiple possible components of a measured placebo effect. These components have varying relevance depending on study design and the types of observations. While there is some evidence that placebo interventions can alter levels of hormones, endocannabinoids or endogenous opioids, other prominent components include expectancy effects, regression to the mean, and flawed research methodologies. The placebo effect is related to the perceptions and expectations of the patient, if the substance is viewed as helpful, it can heal, but, if it is viewed as harmful, it can cause negative effects, which is known as the NOSPO effect. In 1985, Irving Kirsch hypothesized that placebo effects are produced by the self-fulfilling effects of response expectancies in which the belief that one will feel different leads a person to actually feel different. According to this theory, 
the belief that one has received an active treatment can produce the subjective changes thought to be produced by the real treatment. Placebos can act similarly through classical conditioning, wherein a placebo and an actual stimulus are used simultaneously until the placebo is associated with the effect from the actual stimulus. Both conditioning and expectations play a role in placebo effect, and make different kinds of contribution. Conditioning has a longer-lasting effect, and can affect earlier stages of information processing. Those that think that a treatment will work display a stronger placebo effect than those that do not, as evidenced by a study of acupuncture. A placebo presented as a stimulant will have this effect on heart rhythm and blood pressure, but when administered as a depressant, the opposite effect. Perceived ergogenic aids can increase endurance, speed and weight lifting ability, leading to the question of whether placebos should be allowed in sport competition. In addition, there are ethical and moral concerns related to their use and we must be cautious of policies and practices that exploit placebos to the detriment of athletes' health and well-being. Because placebos are dependent upon perception and expectation, various factors that change the perception can increase the magnitude of the placebo response. For example, Studies have found that the color and size of the placebo pill makes a difference, with hot-colored pills working better as stimulants while cool-colored pills work better as depressants. Capsules rather than tablets seem to be more effective, and size can make a difference. One researcher has found that big pills increase the effect while another has argued that the effect is dependent upon cultural background. Motivation may contribute to the placebo effect. The active goals of an individual changes their somatic experience by altering the detection and interpretation of expectation congruent symptoms, and by changing the behavioral strategies a person pursues. Motivation may link to the meaning through which people experience illness and treatment. Such meaning is derived from the culture in which they live and which informs them about the nature of illness and how it responds to treatment. Research into the placebo treatment of gastric and duodenal ulcers shows that this varies widely with society. The placebo effect in treating gastric ulcers is low in Brazil, higher in Northern Europe, and extremely high in Germany. However, the placebo effect in treating hypertension is lower in Germany than elsewhere. Though the placebo effect is typically associated with deception in order to invoke positive expectations, studies carried out by Harvard Medical School have suggested that placebos can work even without deception. In an attempt to implement placebos honestly, 80 patients suffering from IBS were divided into two groups one of which receiving no treatment, while the other were provided with placebo pills. Though it was made clear the pills had no active ingredient, patients still reported adequate symptom relief. Another similar study, in which patients suffering from migraines were given pills clearly labeled placebo, but still reported improvements of their symptoms. Functional imaging upon placebo analgesia shows that it links to the activation, an increased functional correlation between this activation, in the anterior cingulate, prefrontal, orbitofrontal and insular cortices, nucleus accumbens, amygdala, the brainstem periaqueductal gray matter, and the spinal cord. The higher brain works by regulating subcortical processes. High placebo responses link with enhanced dopamine and muopioid activity in the circuitry for reward responses and motivated behavior of the nucleus accumbens, and, on the converse, anti-analgesic nospos responses were associated with deactivation in this part of the brain of dopamine and opioid release. 
such analgesic placebos activation changes processing lower down in the brain by enhancing the descending inhibition through the periaqueductal gray on spinal nociceptive reflexes, while the expectations of anti-analgesic nospos acts in the opposite way to block this. Parkinson's disease Placebo relief is associated with the release of dopamine in the brain. Depression. Placebos reducing depression affect many of the same areas that are activated by antidepressants with the addition of the prefrontal cortex. Caffeine. Placebo caffeinated coffee causes an increase in bilateral dopamine release in the thalamus. Glucose. The expectation of an intravenous injection of glucose increases the release of dopamine in the basal ganglia of men, methylphenidate, the expectation of intravenous injection of this drug in inexperienced drug users increased the release of dopamine in the ventral cingulate gyrus and nucleus accumbens, with this effect being largest in those with no prior experience of the drug. The brain is also involved in less studied ways upon non-analgesic placebo effects. Functional imaging upon placebo analgesia has been summarized as showing that the placebo response is mediated by top-down processes dependent on frontal cortical areas that generate and maintain cognitive expectancies. Dopaminergic reward pathways may underlie these expectancies. Diseases lacking major top-down or cortically-based regulation may be less prone to placebo-related improvement. The brain has control over the body processes affected by placebos. In conditioning, a neutral stimulus saccharin is paired in a drink with an agent that produces an unconditioned response. For example, that agent might be cyclophosphamide which causes immunosuppression. After learning this pairing, the taste of saccharin by itself is able to cause immunosuppression, as a new conditioned response via neural top-down control. Such conditioning has been found to affect a diverse variety of not just basic physiological processes in the immune system but ones such as serum iron levels, oxidative DNA damage levels, and insulin secretion. Recent reviews have argued that the placebo effect is due to top-down control by the brain for immunity and pain. Pacheco Lopez and colleagues have raised the possibility of neocortical sympathetic immune axis providing neuroanatomical substrates that might explain the link between placebo-slash-conditioned and placebo-slash-expectation responses. 441 a recent fMRI study has shown that a placebo can reduce pain-related neural activity in the spinal cord, indicating that placebo effects can extend beyond the brain. Dopaminergic pathways have been implicated in the placebo response in pain and depression. Evolutionary medicine identifies many symptoms such as fever, pain, and sickness behavior as evolved responses to protect or enhance the recovery from infection and injury. Fever, for example, is an evolved self-treatment that removes bacteria or viruses through raised body temperature. These evolved responses, however, also have a cost that depending upon circumstances can outweigh their benefit. According to the health management system theory proposed by Nicholas Humphrey, the brain has been selected to ensure that evolved responses are deployed only when the cost-benefit is biologically advantageous. To do this, the brain factors in a variety of information sources, including the likelihood derived from beliefs that the body will get well without deploying its costly evolved responses. One such source of information is the knowledge the body is receiving care and treatment. The placebo effect in this perspective arises when false information about medications misleads the health management system about the likelihood of getting well so that it selects not to deploy an evolved self-treatment. Similar to the placebo effect, 
inert substances have the potential to cause negative effects via the NOSPO effect. In this effect, giving an inert substance has negative consequences. The placebo effect works at the time, but can wear off and make you feel unwell again. Another negative consequence is that placebos can cause side effects associated with real treatment. One example of this is with those that have already taken an opiate, can then show respiratory depression when given it again in the form of a placebo. Withdrawal symptoms can also occur after placebo treatment. This was found, for example, after the discontinuation of the Women's Health Initiative study of hormone replacement therapy for menopause. Women had been on placebo for an average of 5.7 years. Moderate or severe withdrawal symptoms were reported by 4.8% of those on placebo compared to 21.3% of those on hormone replacement. It is also often ethically challenging in practice to use placebos as a form of treatment. A study of Danish general practitioners found that 48% had prescribed a placebo at least 10 times in the past year. The most frequently prescribed placebos were presented as antibiotics for viral infections, and vitamins for fatigue. Specialists and hospital-based physicians reported much lower rates of placebo use. A 2004 study in the British Medical Journal of Physicians in Israel found that 60% used placebos in their medical practice, most commonly to fend off requests for unjustified medications or to calm a patient. The accompanying editorial concluded, we cannot afford to dispense with any treatment that works, even if we are not certain how it does. Other researchers have argued that open provision of placebos for treating ADHD in children can be effective in maintaining ADHD children on lower stimulant doses in the short term. Critics of the practice responded that it is unethical to prescribe treatments that do not work and that telling a patient that a placebo is a real medication is deceptive and harms the doctor-patient relationship in the long run. Critics also argued that using placebos can delay the proper diagnosis and treatment of serious medical conditions. Legitimate doctors and pharmacists could open themselves up to charges of fraud or malpractice by using a placebo. Changes over time about 25% of physicians in both the Danish and Israeli studies used placebos as a diagnostic tool to determine if a patient's symptoms were real, or if the patient was malingering. Both the critics and defenders of the medical use of placebos agreed that this was unethical. The British Medical Journal editorial said, that a patient gets pain relief from a placebo does not imply that the pain is not real or organic in origin, the use of the placebo for diagnosis of whether or not pain is real is misguided. The placebo administration may prove to be a useful treatment in some specific cases where recommended drugs cannot be used. For example, Burn patients who are experiencing respiratory problems cannot often be prescribed opioid or opioid derivatives, as these can cause further respiratory depression. In such cases placebo injections are of use in providing real pain relief to burn patients if those not in delirium are told they are being given a powerful dose of painkiller. Referring specifically to homeopathy, the House of Commons of the United Kingdom Science and Technology Committee has stated. In the committee's view, homeopathy is a placebo treatment and the government should have a policy on prescribing placebos. The government is reluctant to address the appropriateness and ethics of prescribing placebos to patients, which usually relies on some degree of patient deception. Prescribing of placebos is not consistent with informed patient choice which the government claims is very important as it means patients do not have all the information needed to make choice meaningful.
Beyond ethical issues and the integrity of the doctor-patient relationship, prescribing pure placebos is bad medicine. Their effect is unreliable and unpredictable and cannot form the sole basis of any treatment on the NHS. A survey in the United States of more than 10,000 physicians came to the result that while 24% of physicians would prescribe a treatment that is a placebo simply because the patient wanted treatment, 58% would not, and for the remaining 18%, it would depend on the circumstances. A review published in JAMA Psychiatry found that, in trials of antipsychotic medications, the change in response to receiving a placebo had increased significantly between 1960 and 2013. The review's authors identified several factors that could be responsible for this change, including inflation of baseline scores and enrollment of fewer severely ill patients. Another analysis published in Pain in 2015 found that placebo responses had increased considerably in neuropathic pain clinical trials conducted in the United States from 1990 to 2013. The researchers suggested that this may be because such trials have increased in study size and length during this time period. Individual Differences Placebos do not work for everyone. Henry K. Beecher, in a paper in 1955, suggested placebo effects occurred in about 35% of people. However, this paper has been criticized for failing to distinguish the placebo effect from other factors, and for thereby encouraging an inflated notion of the placebo effect. Genes Symptoms and conditions Pain Depression Chronic fatigue syndrome In the 1950s, there was considerable research to find whether there was a specific personality to those that responded to placebos. The findings could not be replicated and it is now thought to have no effect. List of medical conditions the desire for relief from pain, goal motivation, and how far pain is expected to be relieved increases placebo analgesia. Another factor increasing the effectiveness of placebos is the degree to which a person attends to their symptoms, somatic focus. Individual variation in response to analgesic placebos has been linked to regional neurochemical differences in the internal affective state of the individuals experiencing pain. Those with Alzheimer's disease lose the capacity to be influenced by placebos, and this is attributed to the loss of their prefrontal cortex-dependent capacity to have expectations. Endocannabinoid System Involvement Children seem to have greater response than adults to placebos. In social anxiety disorder an inherited variant of the gene for tryptophan hydroxylase 2 is linked to reduced amygdala activity and greater susceptibility to the placebo effect. The authors note additional work is necessary to elucidate the generalizability of the findings. History in a 2012 study, variations on the COMT gene related to dopamine release are found to be critical in the placebo effect among the patients with irritable bowel syndrome participating in the trial, a research group in Harvard Medical School reported. Patients with a variation of met met for having two copies of the methionine allele were shown to be more likely to respond to the placebo treatment while the variation of val slash val, for their two copies of valine allele responded the least. The response of patients with one copy each of methionine and valine fell in the middle. Release of dopamine in patients with the met slash met variations is thought to link to reward and confirmation bias which enhance the sense that the treatment is working. 
The role of the COMT gene variations are expected to be more prominent in studies where patients report more subjective conditions such as pain and fatigue rather than objective physiological measurements. The placebo effect occurs more strongly in some conditions than others. Dylan Evans has suggested that placebos work most strongly upon conditions such as pain, swelling, stomach ulcers, depression, and anxiety that have been linked with activation of the acute phase response. Placebo-Controlled Studies The placebo effect is believed to reduce pain a phenomenon known as placebo analgesia in two different ways. One way is by the placebo initiating the release of endorphins, which are natural painkillers produced by the brain. The other way is the placebo changing the patient's perception of pain. A person might reinterpret a sharp pain as uncomfortable tingling. One way in which the magnitude of placebo analgesia can be measured is by conducting open-slash-hidden studies in which some patients receive an analgesic and are informed that they will be receiving it, while others are administered the same drug without their knowledge. Such studies have found that analgesics are considerably more effective when the patient knows they are receiving them. NOSPO When administered orally, placebos have clinically meaningful effects with regard to lower back pain. In 2008, a controversial meta-analysis led by psychologist Irving Kirsch, analyzing data from the FDA, concluded that 82% of the response to antidepressants was accounted for by placebos. However, there are serious doubts about the used methods and the interpretation of the results, especially the use of 0.5 as cut-off point for the effect size. A complete reanalysis and recalculation based on the same FDA data discovered that the Kirsch study suffered from important flaws in the calculations. The authors concluded that although a large percentage of the placebo response was due to expectancy, this was not true for the active drug. Besides confirming drug effectiveness, they found that the drug effect was not related to depression severity. Ingredients Another meta-analysis found that 79% of depressed patients receiving placebo remained well compared to 93% of those receiving antidepressants. In the continuation phase however, patients on placebo relapsed significantly more often than patients on antidepressants. A 2009 meta-analysis reported that in 2005 68% of the effects of antidepressants was due to the placebo effect, which was more than double the placebo response rate in 1980. While some say that blanket consent, or the general consent to unspecified treatment given by patients beforehand, is ethical, Others argue that patients should always obtain specific information about the name of the drug they are receiving, its side effects, and other treatment options. Even though some patients do not want to be informed, health professionals are ethically bound to give proper information about the treatment given. There is such a debate over the use of placebos because while placebos are used for the good of many to test the effectiveness of drugs, some argue that it is unethical to ever deprive individual patients of effective drugs. It was previously assumed that placebo response rates in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome are unusually high, at least 30% to 50% because of the subjective reporting of symptoms and the fluctuating nature of the condition. According to a meta-analysis and contrary to conventional wisdom, the pooled response rate in the placebo group was 19.6%, even lower than in some other medical conditions. The authors offer possible explanations for this result, CFS is widely understood to be difficult to treat which could reduce expectations of improvement. 
In context of evidence showing placebos do not have powerful clinical effects when compared to no treatment, a low rate of spontaneous remission in CFS could contribute to reduced improvement rates in the placebo group. Intervention type also contributed to the heterogeneity of the response. Low patient and provider expectations regarding psychological treatment may explain particularly low placebo responses to psychiatric treatments. The effect of placebo treatments has been studied for the following medical conditions. Many of these citations concern research showing that active treatments are effective, but that placebo effects exist as well. It is found that the endocannabinoid system may have a key role in non-opioid and NSAIDs-induced placebo responses, as well as both the therapeutic and adverse effects of NSAIDs. The word placebo, Latin for I will please, dates back to a Latin translation of the Bible by St. Jerome. In 1811, Hooper's Quincy's Lexicon Medicum defined placebo as adapted more to please than to benefit the patient. Early implementations of placebo controls date back to 16th century Europe with Catholic efforts to discredit exorcisms. Individuals who claimed to be possessed by demonic forces were given false holy objects. If the person reacted with violent contortions, it was concluded that the possession was purely imagination. John Hagerth was the first to investigate the efficacy of the placebo effect in the 18th century. He tested a popular medical treatment of his time, called Perkins Tractors, and concluded that the remedy was ineffectual by demonstrating that the results from a dummy remedy were just as useful as from the alleged active remedy. Emile Coué a French pharmacist, working as an apothecary at Troyes between 1882 and 1910, also advocated the effectiveness of the placebo effect. He became known for reassuring his clients by praising each remedy's efficiency and leaving a small positive notice with each given medication. His book Self Mastery Through Conscious Autosuggestion was published in England and in the United States. Placebos remained widespread in medicine until the 20th century, and they were sometimes endorsed as necessary deceptions. In 1903, Richard Cabot said that he was brought up to use placebos, but he ultimately concluded by saying that I have not yet found any case in which a lie does not do more harm than good. In modern times, T.C. Graves first defined the placebo effect in a published paper in The Lancet in 1920. He spoke of the placebo effects of drugs being manifested in those cases where a real psychotherapeutic effect appears to have been produced. In 1961 Henry K. Beecher concluded that surgeons he categorized as enthusiasts relieved their patients' chest pain and heart problems more than skeptic surgeons. Beginning in the 1960s, the placebo effect became widely recognized and placebo-controlled trials became the norm in the approval of new medications. The placebo effect makes it more difficult to evaluate new treatments. Clinical trials control for this effect by including a group of subjects that receives a sham treatment. The subjects in such trials are blinded as to whether they receive the treatment or a placebo. If a person is given a placebo under one name, and they respond, they will respond in the same way on a later occasion to that placebo under that name but not if under another. Clinical trials are often double-blinded so that the researchers also do not know which test subjects are receiving the active or placebo treatment. The placebo effect in such clinical trials is weaker than in normal therapy since the subjects are not sure whether the treatment they are receiving is active. Knowingly giving a person a placebo when there is an effective treatment available is a bioethically complex issue. 
while placebo-controlled trials might provide information about the effectiveness of a treatment, it denies some patients what could be the best available treatment. Informed consent is usually required for a study to be considered ethical, including the disclosure that some test subjects will receive placebo treatments. The ethics of placebo-controlled studies have been debated in the revision process of the Declaration of Helsinki. Of particular concern has been the difference between trials comparing inert placebos with experimental treatments, versus comparing the best available treatment with an experimental treatment, and differences between trials in the sponsor's developed countries versus the trials targeted developing countries. A phenomenon opposite to the placebo effect has also been observed. When an inactive substance or treatment is administered to a recipient who has an expectation of it having a negative impact, this intervention is known as a nospo. A nospo effect occurs when the recipient of an inert substance reports a negative effect and slash or a worsening of symptoms, with the outcome resulting not from the substance itself but from negative expectations about the treatment. Placebos used in clinical trials have sometimes had unintended consequences. A report in the Annals of Internal Medicine that looked at details from 150 clinical trials found that certain placebos used in the trials affected the results. For example, one study on cholesterol-lowering drugs used olive oil and corn oil in the placebo pills. However, according to the report, this may lead to an understatement of drug benefit. The monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids of these placebos, and their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, can reduce lipid levels and heart disease. Another example researchers reported in the study was a clinical trial of a new therapy for cancer patients suffering from anorexia. The placebo that was used included lactose. However, since cancer patients typically face a higher risk of lactose intolerance, the placebo pill might actually have caused unintended side effects that made the experimental drug look better in comparison.